Good evening, everybody. Um, before I start, I would just like to thank uh, Matthew and the rest of the committee for giving me the opportunity to do this uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Ivan Petrov. Uh, I'm a long-term follower of the group, first-time presenter, and as far as my red credentials go, um, I'm an Autodesk Revit professional and BRE Beam certified practitioner. I have been a Revit user since 2011, and I have been involved in BIM coordination since 2015. Currently, I'm working for a practice called Air Chamberlain Gaunt, or ACG, and, um, and uh, I would like to talk about our module template for capacity studies. But before I do that, I want to share my experience with uh, implementing Revit to the practice and um, talk about the reason why we had to come up with this template. So ACG was set up in 2010 as a vector world space practice and started using Revit at the end of 2017. The goal was to completely move to Revit within four to five years. So a year after we started at the end of 2018, we had four Revit projects and half of this architectural staff in the practice had some form of Revit training. About 20% were active Revit users. Now, when I say active, what I mean is they were using Revit for at least 50% of their time. All four projects were either stages three or four. And the reason for uh, doing those projects uh, at this stage in Revit was either a requirement from the client or also, in general, there's that opinion in architectural practices, at least as far as my experience go, is that Revit is not suitable for all stages uh, of a project and its value is only producing technical design. Now, um, that's not the case, but um, it's mostly, in my opinion, most people with limited Revit experience that share that opinion and in most practices that I've worked for, um, that kind of people were management staff or people who make the big decisions. So it's hard to argue with them. And uh, keeping that in mind, we thought that what we did in the first year was a good plan and we decided to continue that direction by concentrating on uh, late stage projects and gain more Revit experience and expertise there. And once all of our late stage projects are done in Revit, then we can go back if needed and concentrate on uh, concept design and capacity studies. A year after that, the end of uh, 2019, we did a report on how things were going. Um, and it showed that the number of Revit projects did not improve. And although more people had Revit training in the practice, the number of active users was still the same. Uh, what happened was that existing projects remained designed in Vectorworks and new coming projects were not given to Revit teams. And as you can imagine, that was quite disappointing, at least for me. So we did a further analysis of what was happening and we reached the conclusion that there are two main reasons for that. The first one is slow upskilling. Now, we are offering uh, regular training to the staff, but theoretical training on its own uh, is just not enough to progress. Um, management didn't think that skills were there to run more Revit projects, uh, to run them efficiently enough and make enough money. And because we didn't have enough projects in the practice, that didn't mean that the Revit users could not work on that and develop their practical skills. And the second one is the culture. Now, in most practices, at least the, the ones that I've worked for, uh, there's always been that very strong and rigid top-to-down structure. And management, the people who make the decision, didn't want or were afraid to uh, learn from subordinates. And um, they tend to make decisions on their own. And in most cases, this is perfectly fine. Uh, but uh, in this case here, this is a problem because um, no Revit, uh, there are no Revit users in our management team, and therefore they cannot know uh, all the advantages that the software can bring, especially if you take into account um, Dynamo and automation. So for them, it's very easy to stick with the software that they've used for decades and had reasonable experience with. It's like, we've done that for years, nothing's broken, we're still making money, so why change things? So the bottom line is that 
things were not working or they weren't working as fast as we wanted to. So we, changed, we decided to change strategies and target capacity study projects and challenge that perception that Revit is not really appropriate software for, for that type of work. And there were a few advantages to, to, to this strategy. On one hand, there were more capacity studies coming into the pro practice compared to the late stage projects. And also uh, the model for those would be relatively simple and therefore they will require less user skills. We are hoping that once a project has started in Revit from capacity stage, then it will continue being done in Revit all the way through the uh, life of the design. Also, I need to mention that in addition to this change of strategy, we, and in addition to the standard Revit training that we're offering, um, we started working even more closely with individuals from the design team that had active interest in Revit uh, and automation so that we have a better chance to come up with more efficient workflows. Now that we've done that, the question was how to actually approach those capacity studies. Um, I'm not going to go into details why, but we decided that we don't, gonna work, uh, we don't want to go with the conventional way of building models with masses, walls, and rooms or area elements. Uh, we wanted to do something different that will attack, uh, attract the attention of the team. So we tried different things. At, at the end, we came up with a template that consisted of pre-built units that had most of the required metadata for the accommodation schedules already loaded into them. And actually this is how the unit looks like. It's created as a generic model and it consists of three, element, three elements. Each of those elements is a different subcategory and that allows us to easily turn them on and off and control visibility inside the project model. So we have the external massing, which represents the external wall and half of each party wall plus the floor that enclosed the internal space. We have the internal mass, which represents the internal space enclosed by the external party walls and the floor. And then we have the balcony mass. Here we actually have two elements, one for projecting and one for concave balcony, but they have visibility parameters attached to them. So only one of them is visible at any point of time. And this is how the family looks like in the family editor in a plan view along with its dimensional parameters. As you can see, in terms of geometry, it's pretty straightforward. Um, but for us, it was at this stage, it was important um, that all the metadata that we need for the, our schedules is already there and users don't have to worry about it. So it's the parameters where the family works the hardest. And we have five groups of parameters. We have dimensional parameters, which drive the geometry of the family. Uh, some of them are instance parameters, such as width, length, the balcony dimensions, or the double leg dimensions. Um, that allows us to have a variety of unit sizes uh, while having a um, minimal number of unit types. Other parameters, such as uh, the internal and external party thicknesses, those are type parameters which help us be consistent throughout, consistent throughout the project. Um, the next group of parameters, those are the data parameters, and they can be area parameters. Those are calculated parameters by formulas. Some of them can get quite long, um, or they can be a uh, number of parameters that require user input and are used for actually generating the accommodation schedules. So such parameters can be number of beds, number of um, occupants, um, unit type, uh, parking spaces, required by truck, and so on. What's important to say here is that those, all of those parameters are shared parameters, and you'll see later why this is important. Moving on to the next group. Sorry. Moving on to the next group, those are the reported parameters. Um, those are all parameters that are driven by formulas and are only used for calculation of the various areas. For example, we have two parameters for wall thicknesses, the calculation wall thicknesses and the actual wall thickness. So the actual wall thickness is an instance parameter, which depends if the wall is thick as internal or external. It could um, take the value of the um, 
type parameter for external wall thickness or for internal wall thickness. And the same goes for the calculation thickness parameter, which is used for the calculation of the net internal area. If the wall is thick as external uh, wall, uh, then the value of that parameter is zero and it doesn't affect the net internal area. The next group that we have is a graphics parameter. And those are all, uh, all of those are yes and no parameters. And they define if uh, a wall is external or party wall, whether uh, the balcony is, is projecting or concave, or whether the, uh, the position of the dog leg, if the unit has one, or the type of roof, if we're talking about house units. And then we have material parameters. Um, and those parameters uh, comply with our, uh, sorry, those parameters comply with our uh, standards in the practice and each type of unit has its own uh, color. So this was as far as the family goes itself and this is the most basic unit. Uh, what users see in the template is actually 125 instances of such families. Uh, 95 of those instances are residential units and further non-residential. Um, and in this slide, the units are color coded by their type. So uh, studios, one beds, two beds, three beds, four beds, and so on. Um, and on this slide, they use it, uh, the units are color coded by their uh, family. So we have nine residential families and one non-residential, the one in gray. And the residential could have different shapes, rectangular, with a dog leg, with angled wall, angled wall and a dog leg, multi-story, multi-story with a dog leg, house unit, uh, house unit with extensions and so on. Um, in terms of number of the families created, we could have put everything into a single family, but from past experience, we know that those all-in-one families are never a good idea and they are to be avoided. We want to make things easy enough so in future if something needs to change it's going to be very easy plus because of the different shapes the formulas for calculating the areas could get quite lengthy quite complicated if we push everything into one um, and in terms of the instances again it probably looks like a lot in a single template but our goal is to make the life of the users as easy as possible as easy as possible uh, here they have almost every type and shape of the unit that they might have in their projects. Uh, all they need to do is just adjust the size and arrange it in the plot. And when I say almost every size uh, and shape, I mean that probably in 1% of the cases, uh, the users might need the unit with an odd shape, which is not here in the template. And there's a work around this. So they can build that unit as an in-place mass and use a dynamo script that, we, that we've used to quickly push the area back into the unit. And this is how it works. Let's say that we want to chamfer that corner of the building here. All we need to do is create a in-place model, make sure that it's a generic model, name it correctly, that's very important, and draw the shape that we want to. Now, this is a very simple shape. It's a very simple example. Uh, we're gonna move the original unit slightly so that we could take a look at its parameters, go to the other parameters and see that all of those have values which are driven by formulas. The new unit has the same parameters, but there are no values for those. Uh, all you need to do is go to our script, choose what type of error we wanna push, and there you go. Now we have the area here. Uh, the other thing that we can do is just type the uh, uh, other text parameters if you want to and tidy up the drawing a little bit. Also the script can work with multiple units. So once the user has, has uh, drawn all of their custom units, they can run the script once and you'll push the areas to all of the units. Uh, here we have uh, what the possible out outcome that will be uh, when, it, when it comes to graphics. And if we're talking about uh, no graphical output, uh, rather than using um, Revit schedules we, for our accommodation schedules for, for the thing that goes to, to the client, we are using a custom built generic annotation family and a dynamo script that extracts the data from our model and pushes it back to the generic model. 
to the generic annotation, sorry. Um, the reason for doing this is very simple. Every practice that I've worked for had, had their own format for accommodation schedules. Um, and it usually included additional calculation with percentages or other stuff that were not possible to be created through a Revit schedule or at least not with a manageable number of Revit schedules put together. Uh, this meant that um, schedules had to be created in Excel and, um, and this is, and sometimes in some cases I've seen people counting numbers on the screen and then typing the numbers in Excel, which obviously it's not perfect. Um, first, it's time consuming. And second, uh, there's a very high risk of error, especially when changes are made, uh, changes are made at the last minute just before submission. Um, with using our custom family and the Dynamo script, we are not only achieving fast and accurate uh, generation of those accommodation schedules, but we also staying true to the um, BIM principles and having our Revit model as a single source of truth rather than having the deliverables in two, three, four, or, or more different softwares. Um, and let me show you how this works. So we have a sheet with two views of the same project. We have two different design options here. And here we can see each view per design option. And here we have the two generic annotations. All we need to do is go to our scripts, run the residential one. Here we can choose which design options we can extract the uh, data from. All we need to do is click generate and then select the generic annotations to which we want to push the data. We can do the same thing, quite easy, for the second design option. Uh, and push it back. So it's not the most elegant script. It could be done in a different way, much more user-friendly. But for us, it does the work, uh, especially when we have design meetings or meetings with client. It means that we can have multiple options on the same project put on the screen, um, make the changes that we need to, and regenerate those accommodation schedules. And uh, we usually work with percentages of the different units, and that means that we can see the percentages straight away. Um, now, we are using uh, a master unit schedule that uh, contains all the units used in our project, but we're using it only as a work in progress tool to manage all the metadata embedded into the units. So each unit has a minimum net area parameter with its value already in there. And we have a column with um, a calculated column with the difference between the achieved and the minimum area. And this is a very useful tool for the teams to quickly check whether uh, whatever they've designed um, has achieved the required minimum area or they have process the unit. Obviously if that um, value is negative, the cell is gonna be highlighted in red. And this is as far as what the template does for the capacity stage itself. Um, but for us in the practice, it was very important that the template does much more than that so we can get more attention and can, um, we wanted to aid the users once the project has passed the capacity stage and once it has progressed towards planning, uh, to give them the opportunity to spend more time in doing what they like the most, designing and making their building pretty. Um, so that's why we created another script which um, generates uh, a different model from our um, capacity study model with walls, walls, roofs. Um, and what's important about the script is that it structures the model exactly as we want it to be. A, it's compliant to our internal standards, and B, in terms of groups, it's uh, efficiently uh, organized. And let me show you how this works. So here we have a very basic generic model, uh, capacity model, each typical floor is grouped. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch off the generic models just so they don't get in the way. Uh, now I'm gonna run the first part of our script and here we get to choose uh, the type of walls and floors that we're using. And also we can play with the floor height if we want to. We 
can click on generate. We wait a few seconds, it's fairly quick. And now we have one instance of each typical floor. If we zoom in, we can see that there are some imperfections. So there was overlapping, but that can be easily fixed. Uh, once we've done this, we can run the second part of the script, which is actually going to take those groups of typical floors and it's going to place them to their levels. While we're naming the group structure. And that's all that the script does. It's very simple. It's nothing fancy, but we thought that was very useful. It could save anything between a couple of hours to a couple of days of works, depending on the size of the project. Um, and here, actually, this is the first project on which we've tested that. And we're quite happy with the results because we could switch between uh, stages quite easily. And that's pretty much it uh, from my side. Do you have any question, guys? Um, if anyone's got any questions, they can either raise their hand or they can type it into the chat box. Um, if there aren't any questions, um, I'll just I, I, put a, I put a question in the chat box, um, just more like an observation. I noticed you're using um, Dino, I think. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, definitely talk to uh, Data Shapes. They've got a really interesting uh, project they're working on at the moment called Orchestra, and it's basically like that, but on steroids. Oh. Um, and it's still in beta, but it's got a lot more features that are good for like a large company scale where you can manage it all in the cloud and deploy scripts really easily. So def definitely worth checking out. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's good advice for us. Uh, yeah, the thing that I forgot to say is that we're using Dyn browser, and for us, this was a game changer. Um, mm. Just because we, the practice has started using Revit quite recently, and for our users, uh, making them to open a Dynamo script and it, they could get quite big, and it, is, it could be quite scary for them. While if it's put just as a button in your know, um, custom mm. tab, then we, we we found out that people are much more likely to use that. And this is where we, we actually try to bring the most value at this point of time by saving time and showing to management that it's in terms of efficiency, there's mm. much savings yeah. to be done with. with and web. also I noticed um, you had all your typical floor groups. Um, I've, I've done a similar workflow in a company in the past. And one thing I found really useful if you're not already doing it is for the like stairs and lifts and those sort of elements. I made those like a, a level to level based family. So it has a base level and a top level. And mm -hmm. then you can take the like the lift through the entire building. So it doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about misalignments. Um, I found that was quite a useful sort of strategy to, to mix with the, the typical unit floors. Yeah, we, we, we tried that as well. Um, in terms of misalignments, it works great. But mm -hmm. for us, the problem was that um, it cannot be in the typical floor groups which yeah. means that the script was not generating or, or, or I'm guessing it could generate it if it's in a different group. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that, that is a viable option as well. Mm. Yeah, oh, nice work, very, very impressive. Yeah. Um, the, the whole template is quite simple and we came up with it by ourselves because we had to, but I'll be very surprised if nobody else isn't using something similar. So if somebody here or somebody later watching the video on YouTube, um, they are watching something similar. I want to exchange some information then. Yeah, just drop me a note and uh, I'm happy to help. Um, so we've got a question from Paul. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, it looks really great. It looks really smart. Uh, I was just wondering if you tried it on uh, any projects uh, in different sectors. Um, no, just residential. Uh, we had an educational project. But because we don't have that much repetition of units, uh, I think that they did it just as a, um, they first started with just uh, in place massing and then went to the conventional world building walls around it. Uh, we haven't tested it. If we got the opportunity, we definitely will. Um, yeah, great. That, that's what I was thinking. The uh, the repetition lends itself to the, to this kind of work. You, you've obviously invested a lot in building the uh, the structure for uh, creating the designs, and uh, you, uh, it needs to um, have that repetition to pay off. That, that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Guys. Okay, brilliant. Have we got any more questions?
No, I think that's it. Well, thank you very much. That was a, a great presentation. Um, now I'm going to hand over to uh, Matthew, who's going to do um, a poll for us all.